Slow Tango in South Seattle is a James Burroughs directed episode. Given he directed both this and the pilot of Friends this week, Mr. Burroughs was a very busy man. Hello, and welcome to the 25th episode of Razor Fridays, where all the salads are tossed and all the eggs are scrambled. Today, we're looking at the season two premiere of Frasier, entitled Slow Tango in South Seattle. This week's title is a play on the title of the Robert James Waller book, Slow Waltz in Cedar Bend. This book chronicled an affair of an economics professor. The book was the third best-selling book on its release in 1993, getting beat out only by Waller's own sequel, Bridges of Madison County, and the John Grisham novel, The Client. Coming almost 30 years removed from the event, the kind of book this was is still obvious, but the direct reference with the title feels dated. If this were made today, I suspect the book would be a Fifty Shades of Grey parody. Although, I can't imagine Fraser having anything to do with what that book is about. Anyway, Slow Tango in South Seattle originally aired on September 20th, 1994, and attracted 20.7 million viewers, a drop of 9 million viewers from the season 1 finale. Fraser moved from its Thursday night lineup with Seinfeld to Tuesdays with season 2, where it was now paired with Wings and the short-lived Martin Short Show. While Seinfeld stayed on Thursdays and was paired with the new NBC comedy Friends. Friends is another mega hit, whose pilot was directed by James Burroughs. I think I want to throw ratings for all three shows up there from now on. Friends pulled in a slightly higher rating than Frasier in its debut, with 21.5 million viewers. But the real behemoth this week was Seinfeld, with its season 6 premiere. Welcoming director Andy Ackerman on as the new regular director. It scored a massive 32.8 million viewers. Over 12 million viewers more than the season 2 premiere of Frasier, and by far the biggest gap we've seen between the two series thus far. Slow Tango in South Seattle is a James Burroughs directed episode. Given he directed both this and the pilot of Friends this week, Mr. Burroughs was a very busy man. On writing duties this week, we find Martin Weiss for his first and only episode of the series. Weiss hasn't written a whole lot and isn't even known as a writer. He's primarily worked as a producer, most notably on The Golden Girls, The John Lorquette Show, Made Simple Roles, and I'm Dying Up Here. He wrote 10 episodes each of The Golden Girls and 8 Simple Roles. With those exceptions, he's never written more than three episodes of any show. This episode's intro starts out with some changes from what we're used to. We have a red logo with season two, and a whole new introduction with fireworks exploding over the city. It's a nice change from what we've seen before, and I'm excited to see what other new intros we're going to get this season. The episode opens with our guest caller scene. This week's guest caller is James Spader. This is the return of the movie star guest caller. Spader's been a genuine movie star since the 80s, and post-2004 has moved into doing critically acclaimed television. The first thing I always think of when I think of James Spader is Stargate, where he played Dr. Daniel Jackson in the movie, but declined to come to the television series, where Michael Shanks took over the role and honestly did a much better job of it. My lukewarm feelings on Spader and Stargate aside, He's done a lot of work, including Seinfeld, Boston Legal, The Office, Avengers, Age of Ultron, and The Blacklist, which I didn't realize just ended this year, and ran for a whopping 10 years and over 200 episodes. Bader has won three Emmys during his career. Roz gets a great reaction shot in while she's listening to Frasier dismiss the book she's reading as nauseating. It's nice to get to see Roz being the one with a sharp reaction this time, as it's usually Frasier and Niles who get in the best reaction shots in the series. We transition to a scene of Daphne and Martin doing physical therapy together, and it's nice to see Martin is still doing the exact same therapy he was doing last time we saw him working out. 
Granted, that time, Daphne was threatening to hurt him, and Eddie wasn't there being ridiculous, but it's a nice bit of continuity all the same. Niall shows up with a picture of himself and Maris to give Martin to hang in his room, as he doesn't have any pictures of Niall's family in there. Niles mentions that he saw a signed picture of someone named Kenny Griffey Jr. Griffey is an extremely famous baseball player who is commonly known as The Kid. He played Major League Baseball for 22 years, most of which time he played for the Seattle Mariners and the Cincinnati Reds. He's best known for holding the record for the seventh most home runs in MLB history, with 630 of them. Given Griffey's place in history, it's a little surprise Niles didn't know who he is. We next get a clever line from Niles when it's discovered Frazier lost his virginity to his high school piano teacher. Morton asks Niles if the same thing happened to him, and Niles says no. He was actually learning piano, while Fraser got his Rachmanoffs. Sergei Rachmanoff was a Russian pianist who was considered one of the greatest of his time. This is just the kind of thing Niles would know, and given the double entendre, I found this an exceptionally clever line. This episode also gives us the first scene of Niles and Martin fighting. It's over fast and only lasts for a second, but I really enjoyed it. We've seen Fraser and Niles going at it before, and we've seen some pretty vocal fights between Fraser and Martin, but this is the first time we've seen Martin and Niles going at it. And the fact that it's over a bad romance book makes it even better. Our next scene brings us to one of our guest stars this week, and that's the author of the book, and apparently former Cheers customer, Thomas J. Fallow, played by James O'Hurley. Before we get into O'Hurley's biography, I just want to briefly point out that despite Fraser saying he knew him at Cheers, technically he doesn't say Cheers, but it's way more than implied. O'Hurley never actually appeared on Cheers, as this character or any other. What he did appear on was a 26-episode stint on The Young and the Restless, 75 episodes of the soap opera Santa Barbara, Weird Science, 20 episodes of Seinfeld, Boy Meets World, The X-Files, Sabrina the Teenage Witch, and in more recent years, a lot of Nickelodeon and Disney Channel shows including Drake and Josh, Scooby-Doo, Spongebob Squarepants, and The Wizards of Waverly Place. He's also shown up in Archer, which, if I'm not mistaken, makes him our first guest star to appear on the exceptionally clever The Animated Spy sitcom. Outside of the scripted television world, O'Hurley has his fair share of ties to game shows. He hosted Family Feud for four years and To Tell the Truth for three years. He was also a contestant on the first season of Dancing with the Stars. Amber Edwards, the host of the KACL book show, who is interviewing Fallow, is played by Susan Brown. This is the only appearance she will make on the series, but she's had quite a career before and after this. She's a soap opera star, starting in 1959 with 262 appearances on From These Roots, followed by a 219-episode stint on The Young Marrieds, then 364 episodes on Bright Promise, 284 episodes of Port Charles, and 276 episodes of General Hospital. She is by far our most prolific soap opera star to appear thus far, even considering the sheer number of episodes soaps put out each and every year. This is an impressive resume. Brown passed in 2018 at the age of 86. In addition to getting to meet our new radio personality with Edwards, we get a couple of returning radio station characters as well, with Bulldog Briscoe and Gil Chesterton showing up to give Fraser a hard time about the book. It's pretty funny, and it's nice to see the two of them interacting. Bulldog's never been presented as a smart character, but he manages to come off a little stupider here than he usually does. Before we move on to the rest of the episode, I just want to point out that Edward's book show is also being broadcast out of the same studio Fraser broadcast from. I realize that just from a TV filming perspective, it makes sense to have all these shows take place in the same location, and I suspect it's going to continue to happen going forward. Despite this, it's always going to bother me a little, because way back in the second episode, 
Bulldog said he had another studio he normally broadcasts from. Only now, it doesn't seem like that's the case. Anyway, we have an interesting shot of the newspaper Martin is reading here. Unfortunately, don't have anything to add about it. We can see the headline is, Funding Government Takes a Big Political Wrench. I was hoping I could track down the date of this paper's publication, or find out who wrote the article, or even what it was about. But, alas, I had absolutely no luck with it. So it remains just as a nice glimpse into whatever the news was of the day. Ultimately, Fraser realizes he feels guilty over how he ended things with his piano teacher, and goes to visit her. The woman he encounters there is played by Myra Carter. Carter didn't have a huge career. She had a handful of shorts and one-off TV appearances in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. She had this spot on Frasier, a guest spot on The Nanny, and a decent-sized role in the 1999 Nick Cage film 8mm. The tune Carter is playing on the piano when Frasier shows up is by the beautiful Blue Danube, which is a waltz composed by John Strauss II in 1866. The waltz is around 10 minutes in length. We get a bait and switch after Frasier has his apology to the poor senile woman and we realize the woman who was Fraser's old piano teacher and lover is actually this woman's daughter. The daughter, Clarice, is played by Constance Towers, who is only four years younger than Carter, who played her mother here. Towers is known for her Broadway, television, and theatrical work. She made her Broadway debut in 1965, where she stayed through most of the 70s, until she largely moved to television. That's not to say she wasn't on television until the 70s. Her debut television role was an episode of Tales of Tomorrow in 1952. And her debut movie role was for the 1955 Bring Your Smile Along. From there, she'd go on to appear in a number of soaps and one-off appearances, including Hawaii Five-0, Love is a Many Splendored Thing, The Rockford Files, Capital, where she stayed for an insane 1,257 episodes, MacGyver, Carolyn in the City, and the truly terrible film adaption of The Relic. Since 1997, she's been appearing regularly in General Hospital, where she is still acting today. Tower's date is played by David Cedarhold, who is a that guy who was in that thing actor through the late 80s and 90s. He appeared in Night Court, Doogie Hauser, M.D., Friends, Married, with Children, Lois and Clark, The New Adventures of Superman, and Sabrina, the Teenage Witch. The coda is cute and effective for this episode, but not the most effective one we've had. It works fine for what it is, but I would have liked to see something a little more off the wall for our season 2 premiere. There are two minor goofs in this episode worth mentioning. The first is around the 1030 mark, where Frazier goes to confront Fallow about not acknowledging his contributions to the book. The copy of the book in the office moves by itself on the table between the shots, despite neither actor being close to the book when it happens. The second is we have a few shots for the studio window this week that lets us see the reflection of either the camera or the cameraman's clothing. This happened several times in this episode. A new season didn't necessarily bring us new ties. This week we've got one repeat and two new ties. Both of Frazier's ties are new, which is a nice change to his wardrobe for the new season. Niall's tie is a repeat, making its third appearance on the series, after last showing up in episode 20 of season 1. Our season 2 opener is a solid episode with a number of good laughs, but Far from the best of the series thus far. I enjoyed O'Hurley's Fallow, and after accepting the idea that we're just going to have characters show up that were Cheers regulars, who never actually appeared on the show, I decided it works. It's sort of like in the original Hellblazer run, where every time a new writer took over, they would introduce some of Constantine's old friends who we had just never met before. The idea of Cheers being used this way to bring on guest stars who never actually appeared on the show is an interesting one, and one I'm more than happy to see used again in the future. It's nice to see both Gil and Bulldog back here, 
and the two bouncing off of each other is a lot of fun. They're a pair I wouldn't have seen as friends prior to this episode, so them antagonizing Fraser is a nice touch. I didn't like before when Bulldog talked about paying for sex, and mentioning he lost his virginity with a hooker this week still caught me a little off guard, but helped make a lot more sense out of that line, and gave me a new appreciation for the character. All the main characters were fine this week. Roz being really girly over the book and Fallow was great. Daphne being flat out cruel to Fraser for how he treated the piano teacher was also a good moment and a nice extension of her character. Niles and Martin fighting over the book once they learned it's based on Fraser was a fantastic father-son moment for both of them. The acting and writing were both good this week. That aside, the biggest strength of this week's episode is actually the title cards. The last time title cards had titles this ridiculous was in Duquesne Moss's last episode. This week, they are equally ridiculous, but it actually works really well. Given the topic of the episode, I thoroughly enjoyed seeing all the overly flowery title cards. Finally, the bait and switch at the end of the episode worked, although it did take some of the wind out of the episode's sails after Fraser made his big apology to have to do it again. It also wasn't the twist I thought they were going for. I expected her to not remember Fraser because she'd been with so many different young men during that time, he just blended in with the rest. I'm not sure if this would have worked better or not, but it would have been an interesting change nonetheless. Overall, Slow Tango in South Seattle is a nice opener for Season 2 that doesn't push the overarching plot lines forward at all, but provides us with some fun guest stars, a funny plot line, great Roz moments, and a nice emotional beat for Fraser. If you want to hear Fraser talk about his rug of love, give this 8 out of 10 episode of Fraser a watch. 